guys, in this video, we are going to learn about how to scale your web application to support millions of concurrent users, like many of the famous applications do. Let us start with a very basic system setup that everybody understands. This minimal setup consists of the user device, domain name server, DNS, and a single web server. Whenever the user device tries to access the application, the request is first sent to DNS, and DNS provides the IP address of a web server for the requested domain name. The user device then sends a request to the web server and accesses the web contents. In this system, this single web server contains all the components like the database, backend functionalities, caching mechanism, etc. We can see that this system is not scalable. As the data for the web application grows, the need for storage inside this server will also grow. To solve this problem, we decouple the storage requirements into a separate database. And now, the server will store all the required data in this database. The type of database to use can vary based on the requirements and the functionalities of the web application. Before we move on, it is important to understand vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling is the process of adding CPUs and RAM to your server. There is a limit to which you can add CPUs and RAM to a single computer. Due to this, vertical scaling has a hard limit. On the other side, horizontal scaling is the process of adding more servers into your pool of resources. Even if one server goes down, other servers can take up the request to process. That is why horizontal scaling is desirable while designing large-scale applications. So based on horizontal scaling, if we use multiple servers for our initial system, then how do we decide which server will process the request from a specific user? This is where load balancer comes into picture. In this new setup, user can only interact with load balancer. Load balancer receives the input request from the user and sends it to the server which has lesser load. The server then processes the request and sends out response to the load balancer which load balancer sends back to user. One advantage of having load balancer is that the user only knows the IP address of load balancer and not internal servers. It will prevent any security breach or possible cyber attacks. Now we can see that our system has only single database instance. What if this data instance is crashed due to power outage? The servers can't access the database and will not be able to serve users. To solve this, we can apply similar horizontal scaling approach that we did for servers. Instead of having single database instance, we can have multiple database instances. But horizontal scaling for databases is a little different. Among all the database instances, one instance is called master instance, which will only process write requests, and other instances are called slave instances, which will only process read requests. Data is synchronized between master and slave instances. This process is called database replication. Database replication provides better performance, reliability, and high availability. We can observe one problem here that servers need to decide on which slave database to send requests to. To avoid this, we can have a load balancer for databases as well. This load balancer will take care of taking requests from the servers and will redirect them to database instances. Now, what if the master database instance is crashed? This system will not be able to process write requests anymore. In such cases, one of the slave instances is automatically promoted to master instance. There are many algorithms to select slave instances which can be promoted to master. We can discuss about such algorithms in future videos. As of now, our system is resilient from crash and outages. But we can see that the servers send requests to databases whenever user requests for data. We know that querying to database is costly operation and increases the response time. To reduce the response time, we can set up a cache between server and databases. Cache is temporary storage area for frequently accessed data. Cache is usually stored as key value pair. Whenever server requires data, it can first check in the cache. If it is available in cache, then the data is extracted from cache. If it is not available in cache, then server sends a query to database and once the data is fetched, it is brought into cache. There are different types of caches. When designing the system, 
you need to know things like eviction policy, expiration policy, consistency requirements, etc. before using cash. We can talk in detail about this in the separate video for cash. Cash helped us in reducing the response time, but there is still a problem. Let us say you are in India and you want to access a website whose servers are in US. Your request needs to travel to US and then the response should travel back to India. It will increase the response time and it creates a bad user experience. This is where Content Delivery Network or CDN helps. CDN contains geographically dispersed set of servers used for delivering only static content. CDN servers can store static content like images, videos, HTML and JavaScript files, etc. When a user visits a website, the request will be sent to CDN server closest to the user. If the CDN server has the data that user requires, then it'll serve the data to the user. If it doesn't have the required data, then only it will request the main servers to deliver the data. This extracted data can now be stored in CDN so that it can be delivered if the user requests for it again. The data inside CDN servers contain an HTTP header called Time to Live or TTL, which describes how long the data is valid in CDN server. CDN is a blessing for products like Netflix. Whenever a new season of Stranger Things is released, the main servers will not be overloaded. Instead, users can access episodes from the CDN servers in their own country. Wow, our system now looks super cool. But wait, there is still a problem. Products like WhatsApp, LinkedIn and Instagram uses sessions to process requests. It means that whenever you request for a post on Instagram, it first checks whether you are logged into your account. This session data has to be stored somewhere temporarily as long as session is still active. If we store session data inside one of the servers, then the data would be lost if that particular server is crashed. To solve this, we can maintain a shared session storage, which will only store the session information. Maintaining such a shared session storage is also called a stateless architecture because each of the servers can now process requests independently and each of the user requests no longer need to access same server. This new shared data storage can be relational database, cache or NoSQL database. Generally, NoSQL database is preferred because it is easier to scale. Now, whenever we create such a large scale system, we don't just want to process requests for users. We also want to monitor and log information about failed requests, resource usage, peak usage hours, etc. We can use message queues for that. Message queues are simple queues in which an event can be added by a producer and an event can be processed by a consumer. In our system, we can create set of servers called workers, which will log in information about the system performance. Whenever our main servers want to log any performance metric, they will add an event in a message queue. The set of workers can process events one by one from message queue. Now, what if we set up this entire system in Japan and the entire system goes down due to hurricane? Don't worry. The simple solution is to create multiple data centers in multiple regions. If somebody in Japan is accessing website and data center in Japan is down, then the request will automatically be transferred to the nearest active data center. Now that's what I call good system design. Congratulations! We have designed a system which is ready to serve millions of users. We really hope that you learned something new from this video. We will continue creating more such detailed videos in this system design series if we get good response for this video. Let's target 1000 likes and 10,000 views for this one. Comment down what videos you want to watch next and share this video with your friends. Please subscribe to this channel and stay safe.